Hi, everybody. I'm Kira, your teen librarian at uh, Pueblo City County Library District and Rawlings in particular. And I am very happy to be introducing Christina Gaddy. Uh, she is the author of Flowers in the Gutter, the true story of the Edelweiss pirates, teenagers who resisted the Nazis, which we do have. Oh, there it is. And we do have it in the library, both as a book and ebook. Um, so check it out. And this is a presentation on zines of resistance, which is related to her book, but also is related to basically anytime and anywhere. Um, this is definitely today. Um, and I'm a big fan of zines. Uh, my my teens might know that as I tried to make have them make one page jeans and they just like did funny just pages with funny things cut out and they were hilarious. But anyway, um, I am a big fan of one page jeans because all you need is a piece of paper and something to write with, honestly. So and a pair of scissors. But um, in the packet, if you picked it up, we would have had the zine that our presenter gave us. I did not fold it up for you because I had I have to put 120 of these together and I just didn't have time. But they're easy to cut and they're easy to fold and there are also instructions in there about how to do it um, and a blank page with little numbers for what 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 pages they will turn out to be once you've made it. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to our presenter. And I'm excited. I hope everyone else is excited. Um, so over to you. Thank you. I am so excited to be here. Um, so I'm going to share my screen so that we can see a little presentation that I've made that's going to go along with this. So Zines of Resistance. And I'm Christina K.R. Gaddy. Um, you can call me Christina, you can call me KR, you can call me basically anything. Um, so I'm super, super excited to be here. Thank you to Pueblo Library for, for having me. And um, in the book, I uh, follow three young people specifically and kind of explore the ways in which they, as Edelweiss pirates, resisted the Nazis. But it was a really big movement. There might have been hundreds of kids involved. Um, so there's a lot that I couldn't include in the book, and we'll have some like pictures and I'll read a little bit and then we'll figure out how we can make our own um, eight page zine of resistance in the second half of the program. Um, so I think I just kind of wanted to start with the question of what is resistance because there's I, I get into that as kind of a fundamental question um, in the book and it doesn't I don't really talk about it until the end um, but I think it's in interesting to think about um, because we all have kind of different definitions of that. So um, this is a little academic, but just like, you know, thinking about it for yourself or for others, what does it mean? And these two authors um, have that you are acting autonomously in your own interest, that you're opposing, fighting, or refusing, refusing to submit to abusive behavior and control, you're engaging in behaviors um, despite it being oppositional, or you're simply questioning and objecting to things that you see going on around you. And so then um, I'm gonna talk briefly just about the Edelweiss Pirates and who they were and kind of use that as a context um, to talk about uh, resistance and you know whether what they were doing was in fact resistance. Um, so just to get us situated, we're in Germany during the Third Reich um, in this area that's called the Rhine Valley, which is uh, these cities, Duisburg, Essen, Dusseldorf, Bonn, and most of the action that I talk about in the book happens in Cologne. Um, and in this area, the kids, um, their parents were members of the communist and socialist parties, which are kind of on the opposite end of the political spectrum from the Nazi party. So even as kids though, they are um, joining in youth groups, like these two photos are from, or the photo and the, the flyer are from, 
Um, and they're, you know, kind of learning about these um, ideas. And so even though they can't vote, they're learning about it, they're supporting those political parties. Um, and a really important part of what happens in 1933 in terms of how it impacts young people is that before 1933, you could have all of these different youth groups which are represented by the pins um, on the left-hand side of the screen. So you have communist youth groups, socialist youth groups, political youth groups. You also have religious youth groups. You have sports groups. You have Jewish youth groups, um, you know, all sorts of things that kids could be Boy Scouts, like just lots of stuff that you could be a member of. And then after 1933, basically because they want control, the Nazis say, no, the only youth group that is allowed is the Hitler Youth and the League of German Girls, which is the equivalent for girls. Because you only you have a boys group and you have a girls group and they're not allowed to hang out together. Um, so this has a really big impact on, on the social lives of young people and they're you know a lot less free to do maybe what they wanna do. And so that's where you start getting an attitude of, we wanna be free from Hitler. Um, and these are photos of what were called, Bund, what they called themselves Bundische Jugend. And so they were youth groups that were outlawed in 1933. They weren't allowed to go on these hikes. They weren't allowed to hang out with each other um, because it was outside of that Hitler youth um, her view. And the Van der Vogel, uh, the Bundeshi Yuga kind of took uh, some of their ideas from the Van der Vogel, which was another youth group that um, kind of started earlier around 1900. And they were really inspired by these groups who liked art, they liked literature, they liked music, um, they were interested in like the samurai and Nordic myths um, and just had wanted to have like a really global perspective of things. Um, we'd go on really long hikes where they play music and busk for money um, and, you know, just kind of, you know, not have somebody who was in charge, but just be kids that were wandering around and doing their own thing. Um, and, you know, part of the reason that the Nazis found the Van der Vogel and the Bundesche Jugend objectionable was because they didn't like that international perspective that they had. So the Van der Vogel, you know, were seen as, um, and, and they would just kind of say things that were not true and, you know, go against them. So they would say, oh, you know, the Van der Vogel, that is going to encourage homosexuality, which wasn't okay at the time. Um, and in their view, or, oh, they're promoting, you know, Bolshevist, Russian ideas, Soviet ideas, and we don't want that either. Um, and Bundish is a word I don't translate in the book because it's really hard to translate. Uh, and it's basically like punk or hippie where it just has its own meaning and everybody kind of understands it to, to be this youth movement. Um, and so I just kind of left it as Bundish and Bundische in the book. Um, so these groups are forming from 1933 to 1939 ish. Um, and they have different, they give themselves names, Navajos, Trumpicos, um, Kittelbach, Piraten, Baden Stenza. Um, I talk about it in the book also, but they were inspired kind of by the, um, stereotypes of Native Americans with freedom, and that's why they named themselves the Navajos. And it's it's pretty complicated, but there's a note in the book about it if you're interested. Um, but they would also, yeah, so they'd go on hikes, they'd make a songbook like they have down here with the two guitars, um, and just kind of, again, wanted to be free from Hitler, didn't want to be in the Hitler Youth. They're already kind of developing their own style. You can see a lot of them are dressed similarly. Um, music is already a big part of what they're um, doing. And so um, I should go back and just say that I say 1939-ish because a lot of these young people are born kind of 1920 to 1925. So at this period, you know, they're in their teens, but by the time they get to 1939, they're old enough to be in the military or to be working. So when the Second World War starts in 1939, they're either drafted or put into war industries. And so this kind of, you know, youth group movement is just not something that 
they're able to have in their lives. And also in 1939, some of them do get arrested for being in parts of these groups, because I'll explain that later, but they're always getting arrested for um, being involved in these kind of quote unquote subversive youth groups. And so the Edelweiss pirates start emerging in 1939 as kind of the next wave of young people who are growing up. They're inspired by the Bundesche youth, um, not quite old enough to join it yet, but then, you know, 1939, they start making their own groups. Um, and I follow three young people in the book, Gertrude, who's on the very left-hand side of the screen holding a guitar. Um, and she is, her dad is a communist. He's arrested and sent to a concentration camp, which means that her mom doesn't have enough income to kind of take care of her. Um, and she's really political, anti-Nazi, joins an Edelweiss group because of that. Um, Jan Jülich is in the middle photo. He's all the way on the right with his hand on the guitar. And he, uh, his father is also a communist who has to go underground. Then his grandparents who he's living with are arrested and he's sent to an orphanage. And, you know, all of this is like, okay, the Nazis destroyed my family. Yeah, I hate the Nazis. Um, and so he also just thinks that the you know, Vice Pirates are really cool and that they have cool outfits and they sing cool songs and he wants to be a part of it. Um, Fritz Thailand is here on the right. He is also from an anti-Nazi family, um, but he's kind of in this conflicted position where he needs to work and he wants to get a job at the Ford factory because that's a very good job. Um, but in order to do so, he needs to be in the Hitler Youth, which he absolutely does not want to be. So while he's working at Ford, which is at that time run by the Nazis, um, but still making cars and automobiles, he starts acts of sabotage um, to combat that. Um, before I start talking about the kind of characteristics of what made the Edelweiss Pirates the Edelweiss Pirates and how they engaged in um, what I think of is, is resistance is I just wanted to kind of put out there this idea that comes from a German um, historian about how people resisted during the Nazi period during the Third Reich. Um, and he kind of has it in this like on the one, you know, on the bottom part there, whether it was private or public and whether it was partial. So just a small complaint or general of a criticism of the entire system. And so he says that nonconformity is behavior that's private and small. So it's not really above the level, you know, you're not going to get arrested by the police for it, but it's still, you know, a form of resistance. Um, and then there's refusal, which is opposition to orders issued by authority. It's a little bit more general. It's a little bit more public. Um, there's protest, which is even more public but maybe just against a particular issue and not the system as a whole. And then finally, he only classifies resistance as being a rejection of the Nazi regime as a whole and that you're actively trying to bring it down. Um, and so the question becomes, is this an accurate definition of resistance? I don't, I'm not sure I agree with it. Um, and how do we kind of like think about what people do as resistance and how it you know, does it fit into these categories or is it something different? So I just kind of wanted to throw that idea out there. So style was one of the things that really kind of defined the Edelweiss pirates. They had their own very distinct style and they could see from what other kids were wearing who was an Edelweiss pirate, but also the Gestapo, the police, the Nazis could tell who was a member of the Edelweiss Pirates by what they were wearing. So they had a report that I translate in the book where it's basically like, oh, if they're wearing neckerchiefs, if they're wearing checkered shirts, if they're wearing, you know, boots with their socks, their white socks rolled down, um, those are signs that they could be Edelweiss Pirates. They have a lot of pins on their clothes. Um, so, you know, keep your eye out for that and, and they might be subversive. Because again, if they're meeting and going on hikes like this outside of the Hitler Youth, that is illegal and not allowed. And the Nazis are thinking they are doing something illegal. They got to be stopped. Um, 
the the girls wore you know often these black skirts with um, pleats up the middle or they wore kind of German inspired outfits like you can see this guy here um, the guys were known to wear their hair long um, and it might not look so long in these photos but it was longer than the Nazis deemed appropriate um, and then within the style, but also kind of moving into some other ideas, um, this is a photo on the left-hand side of a young woman named Ruth Drang. And you can see from this that she's wearing pants, which are not part of the kind of quote-unquote feminine ideal that the Nazis would have liked to have seen. So she's wearing pants, she should be wearing a skirt. Um, and that was, you know, a form of subverting what they thought was appropriate. And within that, there you know, were very specific gender um, binary norms that the Nazis believed in. So one of the accusations that they had about these youth groups were that on the one hand, because guys and girls were hanging out together, that was bad and inappropriate. Um, that only guys should hang out together and only girls should you know, hang out together. Um, but then kind of bizarrely at the same time, they accused these groups of encouraging homosexuality, which was illegal and something that people could be, um, punished for. So they claimed that this image on the left, that those were images that were taken out of a Bundesche Jugend, um, scrapbook. Whether or not that's true, we don't know because they could have, you know, totally found them somewhere else and just made that up. Um, but that was kind of one of their accusations as to why these groups were bad. So on the one hand, we have that. And on the other hand, we have something that I find, you know, completely amazing um, for many different reasons, which is that these there are photos that show up in the photo albums of Edelweiss Pirates and Bundesche Jugend where young people are wearing clothing that is not what they should be wearing according to you know nazi standards of a gender binary so girls should be wearing girls clothes boys should be wearing boys clothes and that's what they thought and there was no room for anything in between that and yet you have these pictures of kids who are not doing that and you know the the crazy thing to me about it is that this was something that it found not only could get them arrested, it could get them sent to a concentration camp. Um, you know, women who were involved in sex work or men who were thought to be homosexuals were sent to concentration camps um, and could have died because of, you know, just the way that they were living their lives. Um, so it's pretty amazing to see their expression of, you know, what they want to be doing, but then also really scary that they're doing that, um, in the face of really serious consequences. And music was a huge part of their resistance too. So in almost every single photo, somebody has a guitar, but they also had lots of other instruments. There's a banjo here in one of these photos. They had balalaikas, um, ukuleles, mandolin banjos, uh, violins, just all sorts of instruments. But they were always playing music. Um, and one of the interesting things about the music is that it too was subversive. So you had a Hitler youth approved songbook that people were supposed to be singing songs from. And these guys were not singing from that. And they would change lyrics to make them specifically anti-Nazi, or they would sing songs that they knew that the Nazis had banned um, because they didn't like them. And so here is um, you know, just another photo with some kids playing music and then a page from one of the songbooks. And, you know, a lot of times, like I was saying, these songs were subversive because they were talking, so this one, Johnny Spelunka is talking about traveling to San Francisco, traveling to Kashmir. Um, and they have this really international perspective uh, that the Nazis didn't, you know, believe in. They thought, we're superior to all these cultures. Why would you travel there? You know, you don't need to be kind of glorifying these places. Um, and so this is um, a picture of Jan Jülich, one of the characters that I follow in the book, um, playing the guitar. He really loved the Edelweiss Pirates music. 
um, I'm going to read a little bit and then have him play a song for us. Um, so, Jan had first noticed them in Mind Mandersheiner Square, right next to the school he went to. The square was like a little park lined with trees central to the neighborhood. Jean had seen the guys and girls hanging out there almost every afternoon. The first thing he noticed was the way they looked. The guys had long hair, not the militantly short haircuts he was used to seeing in the Hitler Youth. They also wore short leather pants, checkered shirts, handkerchiefs around their necks, and big wristbands with the Edelweiss flower. Kids weren't supposed to be meeting in groups outside the Hitler Youth. The Gestapo had started calling all of these groups wild and unauthorized, and generally referred to them as Bundesha. The next thing that Jean noticed was that they played guitars and sang songs he'd never heard before. Jan liked all of the songs, Russian songs, American cowboy songs, and German traditional songs. He thought that they were blatantly, he, he thought that the blatantly anti-Jewish songs he had in, to sing in the Hitler Youth were awful. These guys and girls at Mandersheiner Square were different from the Hitler Youth, and that was cool. Their outfits looked different from what other people were wearing. The songs they sang were different. They didn't have a leader. They just got to joke around and do whatever they wanted. They didn't look uptight and weren't into authority. Jan's friend Ferdinand Steingast had started talking to the kids, who called themselves Edelweiss Pirates. Like Jean, Ferdinand was also raised by his grandma and grandpa, and also hated that he had to join the Hitler Youth. Ferdy was outspoken and gregarious, and John shouldn't have been surprised that he went up and made friends with a group of kids he didn't know. He wanted freedom like he thought Americans had freedom. Soon, Jan was hanging out with the Edelweiss Pirates in the evenings, too. Most of the people in the group went by nicknames, and Jean chose Shan from Shanghai in his favorite song, and Ferdinand went by Fan. When Jean joined the Pirates, he was still 13, and the others he hung out with were pretty young, too. For them, going on hikes and trips and just being with one another were the most important things. Um, and so, yeah, so he loves songs. So this is one of, um, not his favorite song, which is, uh, it was in Shanghai, which again, referring to, to China, very far outside of the German borders. Um, and, but this is one that's called uh, Trampen wir durch Land. And that's in said little songs of the Edelweiss pirates um, traveling across the land. So we have, Oops, Jan sing a little bit for us. Ja, ein Lied der bündischen Jugend, was wir übernommen haben und gern gesungen haben, Trampen wir durchs Land. Trampen wir durchs Land, rasen durch die Felder hin. Wer fragt denn noch, wer fragt denn noch nach des Lebens Sinn? Wer fragt denn noch, wer fragt denn noch nach des Lebens Sinn? Lust und Traurigkeit weben wir ins Kleid der Zeit. Dunkle Stunden, Becherrunden, wir sind stets bereit. Dunkle Stunden, Becherrunden, wir sind stets bereit. And so I translated the lyrics in um, the little zine. Traveling across the land, through the woods and fields we go. Who is asking, who's asking, if life's point we know. Happy times and sad are part of our lives that unfold. Through dark hours, if life sours, we will still be bold. All that we do love blows away like the sand and dust. All the treasures, all the pleasures are taken from us. As one, we still march, yes, through our country, true and fro. Let them cry, we stay high. Um, and so what's interesting is also that Jan took this song um, from the Bundesha tradition. So on the right hand side is a uh, page out of a songbook um, that comes from a guy named Vanna Schwista, uh, who talked about how dangerous it was to be caught with a songbook. So he made this one um, super awesome where he like typed out stuff on a typewriter, but then also, um, you know, did kind of collage with cutting out uh, images from magazines. Um, he did some hand drawings in it, but then also, you know, wrote out some stuff. And uh, in the red text there, it says, like the phoenix from the fire, the spirit of the youth will arise from, you know, this destroyed place. 
so it's a really interesting idea that you know he's already kind of commenting earlier on about the the destruction that he sees going on around him. Um, and yeah, so Vanish was also talked about how dangerous it was to be caught with something like this, um, which was something that they would maybe pass back and forth and one friend would write out some lyrics and then pass back or they'd be able to share um, the songs that they wrote. But at one point um, in 1936, Vanna was caught up in a Gestapo raid where they wanted to arrest some of the Bundesche youth and he actually tore up a songbook that he had and kind of shoved it into his bicycle frame so that he wouldn't be caught with it because he knew that that would be a lot harsher of a punishment, a lot you know, more proof that he was a Bundesche youth if he had that songbook with him. Um, and kind of from those songbooks and inspired by the songs, I made the little Songs of the Edelweiss Pirates um, zine. So if you have it, it's done like that and you cut it up and you fold it and we'll talk about how to do that later on um but just to kind of get get some of the songs out there that they sang into the world um and so then another thing that they started doing rather than just kind of having that private uh sharing of songs or sharing of music um the edelweiss pirates started publicly displaying what they were thinking and saying. And they started printing leaflets and pamphlets um, and passing them out to others to get their ideas across. Um, and so the one in the middle says, uh, week of the Bundesche youth, zone one, come back, youth awake. Uh, and that was found by the Gestapo in November, 1942 and so that's actually you know from the Gestapo archive where they wrote a little number and 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 saved it kind of as evidence that there were suspicious um you know youth activity happening um and the one on the right is handwritten you know you can see the little edelweiss flowers around you know in the four corners there um and it says basically, we hope the day that will come where we can be free again, um, where the Gestapo's boot is no longer on our necks, where we can sing the songs that we only sing in private, you know, out in public. Um, we want that day to come. So they're really expressing their ideas in these uh, this public way through these printed materials that they're putting out. And sometimes it would just be a one-off like that where they would draw it and, and could, could um, hand it out. And then um, the one on the bottom left uh, was a flyer that was dropped by the Allied forces, by the British on Cologne as kind of uh, propaganda to, to the Germans to be say, okay, you should not you know, you guys should resist. Um, but Fritz thought that the ones that the the pamphlets and flyers that he and his friends made looked like that, where they kind of did photo montage um, elements. And then, you know, in addition to doing the pamphlets as kind of public displays of um, resistance, they also painted graffiti. So the one says Heil Navajo and the other says Die Bundesche Jugend. Um, and that was found in December 1942, uh, including graffiti on the Gestapo building in Cologne, so on a Nazi building, basically uh, supporting the idea of this youth resistance. Um, and the Dusseldorf Gestapo wrote to the Nazi party headquarters, these youngsters aged between 12 and 17 hang around into the late evening with musical instruments and young females. Since this riffraff is to a large extent outside the Hitler youth and adopts a hostile attitude towards the organization, they represent a danger to other young people. And that was the main idea with the arrest is that they could corrupt the system. And so these, uh, this graffiti following the flyers in November and December of 1942 led to huge arrests where um, up to 700 young people were arrested, um, sometimes in raids of like 30 to 40 people at a time. And 
not all of them went to prison. Um, not all of them were sent to youth re-education camps, which was another kind of option that, that the Nazis would put forward. But the idea was that an arrest would be enough to make these young people scared and not want to participate in these youth groups. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, they were just, um, be, you know, arrested a lot. It wasn't just those big raids. It would be smaller raids like this too. They had those warnings out there of this is how you can identify a Natalvice pirate or a Bundesche Jugend. Um, and so the photo on the top is, uh, you know, after this young guy has been arrested and taken in, um, in Wuppertal by the Gestapo. Uh, and then the photo, uh, the other photo of the kids walking has uh, text written on top of it and some names with arrows. And the idea there was that that was a photo that the Gestapo had confiscated from some young people and uh, were basically trying to figure out who it was that was in the photos of like, name your friends. And that's a big reason why um, the young people were using, the Edelweiss Pirates were using nicknames was because if you didn't know somebody's real name, you could just say, oh, well, that's, you know, Gertrude's nickname was Mookie. That's Mookie. I, you know, I don't know where, I don't know her real name. I don't know where she lives. And in that way, you know, you could attempt to, um, you know, protect your friends. Um, and I just want to read a little bit about from Gertrude about when she was uh, placing flyers around in Cologne. Gertrude could barely see the top of the Cologne Cathedral if she stood outside and looked straight up. The dark st stones ascended into the sky with hooks and points and edges sticking out like sugar crystals growing, growing in a glass. This building was something from the past when people would come from hundreds of miles to pray inside the cathedral at the bones of the three kings from the Bible story. This church was visible for miles around, from the Ford factory to the Seven Mountains, and it was an easy place to spot from high in the air where American and British planes dropped bombs. The heavy doors opened and Gertrude stepped inside. The large sanctuary unfolded in front of her as the doors shut out the light from outside. Almost no matter the weather, the large open space, thick stone walls, and stained glass windows kept the sanctuary cool and dark. This was the perfect place to hide flyers where people would find them. People shuffled around, everyone looking up and around at the magnificence, the light shimmering through the red and blue and yellow glass, putting visitors into a trance. They were not paying attention to Gertrude and her friends. Gertrude had a shoulder bag full of flyers, already folded up, ready to go. She picked up a hymnal and carefully placed it in her bag. Then she opened the book without looking down and slipped in a flyer among the pages of the Holy Songs. She took the book out of her bag and placed it back on the rack in the pew. No paper could be sticking out, and no one could see them picking up the books or putting them back. The Catholic Church also had suffered at the hands of the Nazis, but anyone here might think that what they were doing was suspicious and report them to the Gestapo anyway. She moved along the pews, doing the same trick over and over again, all around the massive sanctuary. She didn't have many flyers, but she needed to get rid of all of them right then and there. Nothing could be found on her person. When Gertrude and her friends didn't have flyers, they had other plans. They would meet up at nighttime and move through the black, empty streets. No light could shine, and there were no streetlights or no stoplights. Every house window had to have a blackout curtain, and cars weren't supposed to drive with headlights. The city was supposed to be hidden from the bombers flying overhead. The cloak of darkness also meant the Edelweiss group could sneak through the streets with their buckets of white paint and scrawl messages on the sides of buildings. One of the newer members of the group, Sepp, had compared Nazis to shit because of their brown uniforms. So he wrote, is your nose still full of brown shit? And as brown as shit, that's how brown cologne is. Wake up. One day, once, the day after a night of graffiti, they heard someone say something like, those pigs destroying the houses, it was definitely the communists, those scumbags, as if the messages they were writing on the houses were worse than the destruction the Nazi war was causing. On the other hand, when they heard people supporting the graffiti, it made Gertrude happy. The more they did, the bigger impact they could have, even if it meant more danger. That was when they decided to drop flyers at the main train station in Cologne. And so as they go through these actions, you know, they're getting closer and closer to being apprehended by um, the Gestapo and by the Nazis. Um, and so the, you know, they were arrested um, and some, it wasn't Gertrude, um, Fritz or Jean, but others of 
the Edelweiss Pirates got involved with um, some other young adults and some adults in what became known as the Ehrenfeld Group. And this is kind of where coming back to resistance of what is it that you're doing that is considered resistance and what is not. Um, and so that group planned to blow up the Gestapo building in Cologne. They amassed um, weapons and ammunition, uh, but before they could carry that out, they were discovered and arrested and executed by the Gestapo in the fall of 1944, uh, which was kind of a last you know, ditch effort. The Nazis knew that they were losing the war, um, but wanted to send this message anyway. Um, and because those Edelweiss pirates got involved in that group, many people considered the Edelweiss pirates criminals who were doing criminal things, even if those criminal things were trying to take down the Nazis. And then those who hadn't been involved with the Ehrenfeld group were also not considered resistors because they weren't organized or they weren't political. They didn't have a specific political belief that they were trying to put forward um, as if saying, you know, just not being a Nazi is not political. Um, and so there wasn't until 2005 that the Edelweiss Pirates were officially recognized as a resistance movement uh, during the Third Reich. And this memorial that's in Cologne at the site of that execution is a completely grassroots memorial. It was created by the community. Every year they have um, a memorial event that takes place there uh, with music and, um, you know, remembrances of the Edelweiss pirates. Okay, and now that we've been thinking about resistance and what it means to resist, um, we are going to make a zine. So uh, you'll need, you if you have your um, piece of paper with the eight uh, squares on it, that is good. If you don't, all you need is, you know, pen, marker, pencils, whatever. Um, two pieces of paper because we're gonna use one for ideas and one to actually make a zine, and scissors, and then your ideas. And in addition to pen, pencil, and marker, you can go as crazy as you want. Um, I brought out some stickers that I have that you could use to kind of cut out, uh, cut out letters. You can, you know, cut out stuff from magazines and kind of do a, uh, collage effect, whatever you want. It's a really free medium. Um, and so I also wanted to just show some examples uh, before we start making our own. Um, and so this one comes from a cartoonist and writer named Sarah Merck on Instagram. You can follow her and check out her zines. She makes a lot of eight page zines um, and a lot of them are about current social justice issues and forms of resistance. So this one she posted on International Women's Day and the friend cover says Women's Day of Protest. And then she writes, for years I only knew of International Women's Day as one of those weird social media holidays that brands use to sell stuff. It wasn't until I left the US that I learned it was a huge day of protest and action. And she has then a phone with somebody trying to sell something and people um, protesting. And she says, around the world, women staged massive actions against capitalism, sexism, gender-based violence, and oppression. And there's a little woman holding up her fist with a shirt that says feminista and saying, Aberto legal. And in the US, we just buy stuff. And there's some products with a classic at the bottom. And then next page, it's like May Day. There are a smattering of pro-worker, pro-immigrant protests on May Day, but nothing that brings any city to a halt. And then she has um, a little self-portrait uh, with a text bubble that reads, how would our country be different if we took a day uh, each year to demand more power for women and to recognize how misogyny intertwines with capitalism? Um, and then the last page, just our country, other countries have social safety nets, the US has women. 
no se felicita, se lucha. So she's using images of her drawing. She's a really good cartoonist, but also just kind of telling a story across the panels. Um, and then ends not necessarily with a statement of we should do this, but just a question of what would look different if we did this instead. So she's kind of asking the, the viewer to think about that. Um, and here are a couple of other examples. Um, and so I did this one, the first one, because it was in German. Um, and so, and I thought that was cool and relevant. Um, but so it's by a German artist named Nia. And their zine is about ableist thinking and in everyday speech um, and thoughts. And so, um, the, the zine is just words. It's uh, just written out ideas and kind of experiences that they've had uh, regarding ableism. The next ones are four in a series called Positive, Body Positivity 1, 2, 3, and 4 by Erica. Uh, their handle is Erica Engdahl, is a 37-year-old blue-haired woman who lives with chronic human who lives with chronic depression and identifies as asexual. Erica is a librarian and event organizer who puts on performance poetry events and a local zine fest. And um, they say, you are not fat, you have fat, there's a difference. Number two says, take up space. Number three says, eat what you want, even if, in, and if anyone lectures you about it, eat them too. And then the last one says, riots, not diets. Um, and then Mariella has one, that has resist on the cover and it's a little video where they flip through and show uh, different images of resistance. Um, Marielle is an artist in Salt Lake City and their work explores the experiences of queerness, migration and displacement while building a space for healing and resistance. Um, so you see there's like a lot of variety of the types of zines. And I think that's one of the amazing things about the eight page zine is that um, even though it's just a single piece of paper, you can have lots of different ideas that go into it and lots of different um, things happening. So that brings us to the first part of our zine making. So I thought we could just start with some brainstorming of um, ideas. So you might already have something that you want to make your eight page zine about, or you might not. Um, and so let's just start with you know, what do you think could change in the world, could change in your community? What do you think is unfair? What do you think people should know more about? What's something that you think people should respect? Um, what's something that makes you angry? What's something that makes you happy? What do you want to tell your friends, parents, classmates um, that you might not want to speak to them, but explain to them? So let's take like five minutes and just start brainstorming ideas. And you don't have to write sentences. Um, you don't even have to write words. You can draw little sketches. You can just use colors. You can use colors and words. Um, we're just trying to get some ideas flowing uh, for our zine. So yeah, five minutes. I'm going to do it too.
Okay, I think that's been about five minutes. Um, so the next thing you want to do is kind of look over your list of things that you've written down or little sketches that you've made and think about how we could make that into a zine. Do you want to tell a story about something that happened to you? Um, do you want to lay out some things that you think people should know? Maybe it's more than one of these ideas. It's like, you know, seven things that you think people should be respecting. Um, do you want to tell a story about how you did something once or um, how you experienced something that was hard or difficult or something that you learned something from? Um, you know, you can really go in a lot of different directions. Um, but we do have our eight pages. Um, so think about like of the things that we wrote down, you know, maybe between three and six ways that you could expand um, what you've done or three or six ideas that you've written down that you think you could, you know, kind of compile into one scene. Um, so I wrote down all of my ideas here my one piece of paper. Um, so let's take another, yeah, maybe three to four minutes to just kind of flesh out some of the things that we might be thinking about, about one of these ideas or putting, pulling together a couple of these that could go onto one zine. Um, so yeah, let's, yeah, let's take like four minutes to do that.
And I guess if you're still thinking of things, you can always pause and come back later or, um, you know, start on the next part, but then come back and refine it. Um, the other beautiful thing with each page, eight page zine is you can kind of sketch out ideas, which is like what I did here on this one for the, uh, what became this, um, to just basically write what I thought was going to go where, and then came back and did the other parts. Um, and, uh, yeah, did the other parts using cutouts and letters and everything, and then turned it into that. So you can always make a draft and come back and fix it up later. You haven't wasted a bunch of time or resources. Um, okay, and then the next thing that we're going to do um, is fold our piece of paper. So, um, I don't know, my screen's not showing up and I'm not sure why. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, so our next one is that we're going to fold to make eight equal small pages. Um, so if we have our piece of paper, the first fold that you're going to make, um, and this is, you just use a blank piece of paper, or if you have you know, more pieces of paper, you can just test out folding if you want to. So you fold it long ways. Some people say that's like the hot dog fold. And then step two is you fold it the other way in half. Hamburger fold. And then, this is the interesting one, you flip the paper over and you fold this edge into the middle and this edge into the middle. And then you should have eight equal squares on your paper. Now, the next most important, no, it's probably the most important thing of the whole zine is that this is the layout of how it's going to be once it's folded into this. So your front cover is on this bottom right hand side, if you're looking at it, bottom right hand side. So it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So all one, eight, seven, and six should all have text that like, this is the middle is going to get folded over. So they should all have text that you can read this way. And then those ones should all have text that you can read that way. So I'm going to leave that up on the screen. Um, and we can start writing down our ideas on our piece of paper. Again, markers, you can cut stuff out. If you want to take a lot of time and you don't want to do it now, you can kind of just like sketch out your ideas. Um, but we will take a little bit of time to just make our zines. Um, and I think I might use some of my stickers that I have. Um, you know, one of the things that I think I don't know, maybe a lot of people were doing during the pandemic, but maybe not, um, was writing to elected officials about um, issues, especially concerning police brutality and Black Lives Matter. Um, and that's where a lot of my cutouts came from, was taking postcards and writing the messages that I wanted to see on those postcards, just like free postcards that I got somewhere, um, cutting out letters uh, to spell out new words. Um, so that's also a fun, doesn't even have to be a zine, just has to be, you know, can have a single leaflet flyer type thing, um, that you can use for that. So, you know, lots of opportunity to do different things with your zines. Um, you 
can also, I think the, the beautiful thing about the eight page zine is that once it is all on one page, you can easily photocopy it. So if you've made something that you want to give out to friends, you want to leave somewhere for other people to read, um, really easy to just make some photocopies and then have them. Or you can just make a one-off that you want, um, like the ones that we were seeing uh, that I showed examples of uh, from Instagram, which is, you know, you do it and then you can take pictures of it so folks can see it that way. Um, and that works also. Uh, and that's what I did with this one was printed out photos and images um, and wrote, wrote things on a typewriter separately and then glued them all to a piece of paper and then photocopied that one piece of paper to make lots of copies. And then I also scanned it into the computer so that I could send it to people if they wanted to print out a copy on their own. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start making my zine at least a little bit. Um, and I think one of the things that StreamYard is really good at is it's really easy to share my screen, but I can't see anybody who's on the other end of it or um, any comments that people have or questions. So if you do have a question, you can always um, go to my website, christinagaddy.com or flowersinthegutter.com and ask a question, ask me a question there if you want more resources or you're curious about something that I said during the presentation. I'm really happy to share more of what I've learned um, about the Edelweiss Pirates and their world um, with all of you. Because like I said, you know, the, the great thing about writing a book is writing a book and getting ideas out in the world. And the sad thing about writing any book is that you can't ever include as much as you want to include in it. Um, so there's definitely things that I couldn't include in the book, but I love sharing with people. Um, and so if you have any of those questions, please reach out to me. And let me know. Oh yeah, I'm cutting things up and it's really great. It's really fun way to do this. So I highly recommend it especially if you can get free stickers from folks. I happen to have some good free stickers lying around that I've been able to use for this purpose. But you could also use magazines and just glue them down instead. Um, that's a fun way to do it also.
And if you're making a zine, you can also, you know, you don't have to write in prose. You could write poetry. You could just do drawings without any words at all. I think that's another brilliant thing about the zine format is literally do whatever you want. Make it look the way that you want. Make it represent what you want it to. I'm mostly a word person, not really a drawing person, so mine's going to mostly be words. <clears throat> so yeah, once you've made your cover in that one, it might be easiest to flip the paper over and then start doing two, three, four, five, before going to the back and doing six, seven, eight. Which is what I'm gonna do because I think I've no, well, not quite done with my cover, but I'm almost done with my cover. Don't worry about filling up the space either. If you want to leave a lot of white space, that's cool too. All depends on how much you know you want to kind of put in there and do. Um, but now I've finished my I've finished my cover, and so now I'm going to do my first page here. I flipped my paper over. So I'm just using what I kind of wrote in the last part that we did, of like fleshing out those ideas and throwing that down on my first page here, writing it definitely a lot faster than cutting out individual letters. But cutting out the letters was fun to And I'm kind of coming up with ideas as I go forward. I had the words and now I'm kind of thinking about the images that can go along with it. Maybe I'll do this one and not like it and then come back and do another one, a different one. I'm not, not totally sure, but we'll see. Perhaps. And if you do make one of these and you share it somewhere online, I'd love to see it. It's 
you can tag me or send it to me. Let's think about thinking about this. I'm definitely using a little combo of combo of stickers that I'm cutting out and writing.
I'm getting close to a place where I can move on, do the rest of it later. Maybe I want to add some more things once I see it folded up. I can add a couple more abstract stickers. Problem when you cut up stickers is they don't come off anymore. That one came off a little bit. And if you're watching this after the fact, you can just fast forward through all this and see the sweet part of how we're going to make it into a zine. Okay, cool. So now we have our, we have our eight pages laid out. And then we are going to cut along this part in the middle to help us fold it. The easiest way to do that is by bringing the left side of the paper to the right side of the paper, or the right side of the paper to the left side of the paper, and making that fold again, and then cutting halfway through, so from the edge into the middle. And you just want to do that one little cut, and you do it along that line, along your middle, your other middle fold line. So you get like that. And then, then we can fold it so that it will actually turn into a book. So basically, you fold the paper lengthwise again. Um, and it's easier if you do it with the text. Well, yeah, you have to do it with the text on the back side, otherwise. Your text will be on the inside. So you fold it like that. And then this is where it's helpful if you've done your folds right. Oh, I put a piece of tape right on the middle there. That's not convenient. If you've done your folds, you might want to fold it again just like that to get your creases nice and good. Um, Still not quite doing it. But basically, once you get this shape, oh, it's because I did that. One. That's why you have to fold these guys in, not out, because they are interior folds. So then, when you fold it like that, it should come into this shape really easily. And page one will be somewhere and then you just put these two flippers in and then you get this shape and then you find where your cover is and kind of fold it and wrap it around that way and then ta-da you should have a zine and so your cover will be there you have that see you have your next page. And your next page. And your next page. <laughs> yeah, and if you you can lay it all out and draw it in pencil, and then if you're like, oh, I want to come back with markers later, or 
I'm going to figure out, you're not going to sit here like me and cut out this stuff <laughs> on this. And you want to find some um, cool stuff to use for a collage. That's a great idea. Um, but yeah, so this will be up and you'll be able to see how to make a zine um, on YouTube. And like Kara said, that will the book uh, Flowers in the Gutter is at the library. Um, you can get the ebook version or you can get the hard copy and it's got, you know, pictures in it. It's got some of those documents that I talked about um, uh, that the shop I have are translated, but it's got lots of pictures in it. Um, some that are that I included in the presentation and others that I didn't. Um, and maybe it will hopefully inspire you to uh, make more zines and resist in whatever way you want, whether that's through making music, making art, um, or getting out and letting people know what you're thinking by being out on the street. So that's all I have. You're muted. I muted myself. <laughs> and I'm back. I've been here all along. I planned my own, but I only have kind of a dull pencil right now. So I've planned it. Let's see my scribbles. There we go. That's a great planning. Um, and so I'm going to make it later. But uh, yeah, mine's kind of personal intense. Oh, it just sort of struck me. Um, but I think it's kind of important for me to do it just for myself. So. <laughs> And that's the other beautiful thing about the eight page zine, which is like, you don't have to make it for anybody. You can just make it and write down your own ideas and not share it with anybody. Yeah. Um, you know, I might share it with my, with my brothers, but uh, I have a brother coming to visit soon. Sorry, I'm really excited. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty psyched. Uh, gonna put that together. I've already been like crossing up. No, I'm gonna put that in there. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was great. And I encourage folks to make zines just like, it can just be like a hobby. You know, it's like, it's like you don't need that much stuff. If you know, you like writing, but maybe you're not into journaling, like you could just make zines and just like write a zine about whatever. Or if you just like being inspired by weird pictures you see, like yeah. have a weird picture and then like have it inspire you to make something, you know? The great thing about it is that you can make it whatever you want it to be. And it's not like big, it doesn't take a lot of like stuff. Like anybody can make it with paper and scissors and a pencil, you know? That's why I love it so much. Um, can you can also make a zine up here. Oh! <laughs> I have kitties. I'm a kitty. I'm a cat person. Um, and Sarah, who I mentioned in the presentation, um, has lots of, you know, like zine about the cat and what the cat is up to, or zine about moving, or um, at one point was doing a zine a day of just, you know, what did you see in the neighborhood? What, what were you thinking about? And yeah, totally in terms of not wanting to do a journal, if that feels like a lot, you know? Yeah, it's just like, well, so I'm going to walk and I'm just going to write down some stuff I saw and then I'm going to make a zine about the stuff I saw on my walk. And that's just, like, that's a great way to be creative. It's a great way to, like, make your walk into more than just a walk so that you're actually, like, present in your walk and, like, looking around and, you know, you're not just walking, thinking about, Meh. sorry, my brain is constantly going, Meh. so, you know, that would be a really good thing. You're like, okay, I'm actually going to completely pay attention to my surroundings and notice what I'm walking by. And I think that's really healthy for a lot of us, especially after this. Well, we're still in it, but after the worst of this insane year. Yeah. Which I think made, I mean, my brain is just like that, unfortunately, but I think it's made everybody's brain. Like, I think it's made the general level of anxiety, like, it's just here. Yeah. Like, you're really close to freaking out for 
I, for a while, it was like, I was not that far away from freaking out, but that was just the regular level. And so you had to be really careful not to like, you know, and I think it's coming down like very slowly, but also there is anxiety about it getting back to normal and going out and seeing people. So um, I think about kids a lot and like the mental health of kids. And I think, you know, not being in school with their, with their friends has been really traumatic, but I think the experience of going back to school with their friends is also going to be really traumatic. It's going to be hard, yeah. And um, so I'm just really worried. Um, and nationally, like, the mental health of kids has been kind of another crisis. You know, it's like pandemic one, pandemic two is mental health, you know? Um, yeah. And so, I, I personally think that writing... Um, and thinking, and you don't even necessarily like need to write a lot, but just thinking about those things can help yeah. this process what we're going through. So if that's, that's really really great. Great. just articulating stuff and getting it out of your brain and onto a page, yeah, um, is healthy. Yeah. So, and I know like journaling is really promoted, but for some people, like I've never really been able to to do it myself. Um, but I think something like this, where it's a different form, you can also add other stuff, you know, I think that could um, appeal to people who are not as adept at just like keeping a journal and you just like, I would, I, I've started and I'm, like, oh, I'm boring myself, you know, <laughs> Whereas, like doing this, it's like, oh, like how am I going to split up? Like there's more, I don't for me, there's more creative thought that goes into this kind of um, into into making an APG. There's like a lot of creative thought. How are you going to break it up? And what are you going to put on this page? What are you going to put on that page? And like, and then you get something that you can look at and be like, oh, I just made this. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm a big fan um, of alternative ways of ex expressing oneself when you can get stuck doing it in the traditional ways. Yeah. And especially since you don't have to write anything at all if you just want to, you know, Draw things. Draw things, put down colors, like it's all good. There's no Yeah. There's it's no rules. It's completely free. Yeah. Um Yeah, so that was really fun. And I hope everybody who's watching now and who watches in the future um will enjoy it and enjoying their making a zine, whether it's their first or not. Um so thanks so much. That was yeah. really, cool. I really liked it like learning about the Edelweiss fires too. Um, so. Inspiration for resistance is all I can hope for. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for having me and happy Friday, everybody. I hope it's a not too hot weekend, but we can always yeah. be inside and make scenes instead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye.